I'm very thrilled to welcome all of you to this session, which is named Building Net Zero Nature Positive Economies, which is part of the 2021 Davos Agenda Week organized by the World Economic Forum. I'm your moderator for this forum. My name is Nancy Ju. I'm an anchor woman with Phoenix TV based in Beijing. Now, the first part of today's session will be centered around a panel which I'm very honored to be joined by Mr. Malik Amin Aslam, the Federal Minister of Climate Change of Pakistan. Inga Anderson, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. Ma Jun, who's the Chairman of Green Finance Committee, China Society for Finance and Banking. Mr. Anderson Tonotto, the director of RGE Group in Indonesia, and Jennifer Morgan, the executive director of Greenpeace International. And together, we will be discussing the elements needed to spur our economies in the world towards a decade of action, which is good for everybody and the planet. Should you be asking any questions to our speakers and panelists, please do share your questions with us in the chat box below. We'll be doing our best to try and answer these questions. So let us now, without further delay, dive into today's discussion. As we all know, in 2020, the World Economic Forum's Global Risk Report has found for the first time in 15 years that the top five global risks facing human society actually come from a single category, which is the environment. So in 2021, in this report um, released just last week, it shows global businesses um, and leaders now see top risks as all being environmental. And now with COVID-19, they've also added pandemics to the top list. And we all know that in many ways, um, these are linked to the destruction of our nature. For example, uh, I'm going to share with you some astonishing figures. If the current raised, uh, rate of deforestation is not stopped, our planet might only have 10% of its forests remaining by the year 2030. Um, it's scary. We're losing the world's topsoil at a rate of 100 times faster than it can be naturally replenished, meaning we're at the brink of an impending global food security emergency. As the UN Security Council um, UN Secretary General, excuse me, Antonio Guterres remarked, making peace with nature is the defining task of the 21st century. Now, we cannot solve these problems with the 20th century framework. The COVID-19 pandemic has made it very clear to all of us, these issues are not environmental issues alone. These are threats to the environment, but also to our society and political stability. So according to the report, Nature Risk Rising, more than half of the world's GDP is moderately or highly dependent on nature. So ladies and gentlemen, um, welcome again. I'm very delighted to be having a truly multi-stakeholder panel to discuss how we can unlock a net zero nature positive economy and what we can all do to play um, and to make this happen. So now I'm going to invite our first panelist of today, Malik Amin Adlam of Pakistan. Minister, the dominant economic model to date has really ignored the value of nature capital from which we can draw critical services such as food production and climate stability. Can you share with us how is Pakistan approaching natural capital and how that approach might be different in achieving the objectives in improving rural livelihoods and meeting the Paris Agreement goals and ensuring that you have a healthy food supply system. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks a lot for giving me this opportunity. And uh, I really uh, feel that you know, the topic that you've chosen today is extremely important, not only for us, but also for the whole world. Uh, Pakistan was already on a nature positive, as you say, nature positive trajectory of growth even before COVID struck. But when the COVID uh, pandemic happened, it really uh, shook everybody up. And it changed the uh, focus of the policy makers to understand the value of nature and the value of thresholds of nature. As you rightly said that, you know, if you push nature, it, it creates problems. But when you push it beyond thres certain thresholds, it creates 
a really uh, threatening problems which is, has created through the COVID crisis, uh, that is an imbalance with nature, the biodiversity crisis, the climate change crisis, all of them are, are happening because we have pushed the thresholds of nature. And we've seen that nature does not stay quiet, it also strikes back. And we cannot fight with nature, we have to change the equation over here. We have to change the way we treat nature. And I think that has been the real philosophy behind Pakistan's development paradigm. And as I said, during the COVID era, we realized that we need to drastically change that paradigm and give it, as you say, a further impetus to move in a nature positive direction. So we announced what was called the green stimulus during the COVID pandemic, which focused on uh, really nature positive and, and uh, nature based uh, recovery out of this situation. So we were trying to look for things which could, uh, number one, protect nature, uh, you know, improve our balance, uh, balance with nature. And number two, also provide us with green jobs that could provide us uh, an economic stimulus to get out of this situation. So we've tried focusing on what was called the 10 billion tree tsunami, uh, which was a project already happening, but we provided it an impetus to start creating more jobs on the ground for people to be planting trees, to be you know, planting nurseries, protecting forests from forest fires. All of these created jobs, which were nature positive, but also COVID safe uh, jobs. And we created about 80,000 jobs doing that. We also uh, started the protected area initiative, which was to uh, not only expand the protected area coverage in Pakistan, but also uh, link it up with green jobs. And so we, so we started a new national park service on the ground uh, for protecting nature. And we are also expanding our national parks. Uh, uh, we had 30 national parks before COVID struck. Now we have 45. So we have gone up 50% during the COVID time. So, you know, these initiatives were nature positive, but they were also pushing us to think about nature in a different way, not uh, as, a, as an adversary, but as a par partner, uh, if you look at uh, economic growth into the future. Now, the question that you asked about natural capital valuation is something that has really been intriguing us. In this direction of a nature positive recovery, what we realized was that nature is not valued properly when we, when we look at decisions of economics or policy making in the government. So we fished around and we, what we found was an exercise which has recently happened in the UK on, on natural capital valuation. Uh, they've come up with a report called the Das Gupta Report. And we use that report to propel our own uh, natural capital valuation exercise. We are in the initial stages of that exercise, but uh, the thinking of the government is very clear that when you start valuing nature, that is when you start protecting nature, and that is how you, you, you create the, uh, you know, the right equation with nature to survive. And that balance is absolutely necessary. Right? Like you said, you know, the framework of the 20th century is not going to get us to the 21st century. We need to create a new framework for thinking of economics, of how we, how we think of nature, not only as a commodity, but also as an asset, which is there, which is valued, and which, are, which has a dollar value. So now we have, we, we have started off by the natural capital valuation of our national parks, which is about 15% of our land area, because these are really you know, biodiversity storehouses, which are very value, valuable. Uh, they are places which no, no, nowhere else in the world, uh, uh, there's a place like that. For instance, you know, the Deosai National Park in Pakistan starts at 14,000 feet. Now there is not another Deosai National Park in the world because uh, you know, this height is not available anywhere else in the world. So the vegetation, the flora and the fauna that exists over there uh, has to have a, a, a very strong value. We don't know what that value is, but we have just started that exercise. And we, we hope, you know, that value will now create the basis for making decisions which are automatically, automatically going to be nature positive. So we don't have to push ourselves on a nature positive trajectory, but the value of nature actually propels us to think of nature as an asset, which has a value, and if we, if we push it a lot, uh, 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 over certain thresholds, it will react. So I think that, uh, that thinking is very positive. So we are looking at various instruments. Natural capital valuation is the start. We are looking at nature bonds. We are you know, going to be issuing our first nature bonds uh, for some big hydro projects very soon. We are also looking at a financing for biodiversity initiative, which uh, ties up the value of nature with, with uh, debt reduction for countries like Pakistan. So that's another innovative thing we are looking at. So it's a compendium of exercises, but as, as I said, the basis of that is to think about nature differently. Thank Great. You. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you.
Um, I think um, I really agree with you that the point when you start to value nature, this is at the point when you start to protect uh, nature and not to treat nature as a commodity, but really see it as an asset, um, something that value. Um, thank you for sharing with us your insights. I'm afraid we have to move on to our next panelist uh, because of uh, uh, we only have half an hour for this live session. Um, all right, so our next question is for Inga Anderson, the Executive Director of the United Nations um, Environment Programme. And this question, we're going to start with the year 2021. Um, we've seen kicks off with the UN Decade for Ecosystem and Restoration. And we'll see the COPs of the three real conventions on climate change, um, biodiversity, et cetera. And given the current context of COVID-19, uh, with the tightening of budgets, how do we unlock financing as well as investment to meet this ambition of having net zero and nature positive world by the year 2030? Well, let me start by saying that it's very nice to come on the heels of Minister Malik Aslam Khan because he's really set out the framework and, and told to us what happens in the national setting. He spoke to the importance of understanding that the value of nature is more than what is intrinsic, that value of the beautiful sunset and the wonderful forest, etc. But understanding that when we invest in nature, we are investing in our own self-preservation. After all, nature provides us everything that we need in terms of services, the pollination, the mangroves that protect us from the high seas, um, the, the coastal forests that break the winds, et cetera, et cetera. What has happened though, that as an investable asset class, it hasn't been clear which pension fund has been putting its money into nature. It hasn't because it wasn't clear how the revenue would come out. But what Minister Aslam Khan has spoken to is exactly this, that when we invest in nature, we are in fact securing the very future of our societies. We can, we can cut the proverbial forests down one year and have a great quarterly return. We can fish the waters empty and have a great quarterly return for our company. And then what? The point is that we need to understand that investing in nature and nature's infrastructure through investing nature-based solutions matters. And here you're referring to these three conventions, the Biodiversity Convention, the Climate Change Convention, and the Desertification Convention. Again, Pakistan has done a great job on all three, and the, the, the Billion Three Tsunami is, is, is an example to us all. But these three conventions will be meeting this year, God willing, and we will be able to have the COPs. What we need to now do is to understand that making the promises of what we will do by 2050 is not good enough. We need to see these conventions be translated into real action plans, action for what we do in 21, 22, 23, up until 2050. We need to be ambitious because otherwise we're just like the marathoner who says in January, oh sorry, the runner who says on January 1st, that he or she is gonna run a marathon by December. But if we do not train and take into action on January 2nd, the, the, real, the real hard work, do the hard work, we are not gonna get there. That is what we need to see now. We need to see biodiversity action, not promises, and we heard from Minister Mas uh, Aslam Khan exactly the kind of actions they've put into the into into uh, place. We need to see real commitments on on 2050 on climate change and uh, net zero, so that we can stretch. And we need to see real commitments on on desertification. And as I close out with my last three seconds, just to say that to make all of this happen, we need solidarity because this is an existential crisis. And without financing and support, this is not going to go anywhere. And that is what we are calling for, for the three COPs. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks, uh, Ms. Anderson. And um, our next speaker is also coming up, uh, Mr. Ma Jun uh, from China. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Now, we know China has signaled a strong commitment towards uh, net zero by the year 2060 and highlighting the role of nature as well. Um, China will also be hosting the UNCBD COP15 later on this year. So please share with us how you think the Chinese financial sector can tr contribute to accelerating the achievements um, of the ecological society? And what barriers do you think um, the Chinese society still face um, to unlock the opportunities to materialize? And I think Ms. Anderson has raised some really good points. Um, we need not only see promises, we need to see action, we need solidarity as well. So please, Mr. Ma, share with us your insights. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, very important discussion. As you mentioned, uh, China declared the carbon neutrality goal, and we're now actually working very hard on uh, producing a roadmap uh, using finance to uh, support the uh, carbon neutrality target, uh, of which uh, uh, nature-based solution definitely a very important part. Now, let me start with a few words on green finance itself, and then come back to uh, the barriers and solutions for uh, nature-based solutions. Now, in terms of carbon, uh, in terms of green finance itself, we have built a, what I call a framework of four pillars in China. Uh, one is standards, uh, which means that we have a set of taxonomies defining what are the uh, green activities that finance should support in the green finance framework. And secondly, we need to have the uh, project owners to disclose the environmental and climate benefits for the uh, green projects uh, so that the investors will know that the green money goes to the green project. And thirdly, for some green projects uh, which have environmental benefits but do not have uh, sufficient cash flow, uh, they need incentives. Uh, for example, at the central bank level, the PBOC introduced a green relanding facility, which offers uh, low cost funding to commercial banks and through commercial banks to support green projects. And the local governments offered interest subsidies and guarantees for green projects as well. And finally, uh, the pillar is what I call the uh, products. Uh, we need many kinds of green finance products to support uh, uh, short-term project, long-term project, projects that require uh, risky capital and the project that require uh, risk management products. And uh, now coming back to the question on how to finance uh, uh, nature-based solutions, this is a harder part of green finance because in the past years, we have seen a lot of financing going to big infrastructure projects such as renewable energy, solid waste, water treatment, and so on, but very little uh, still into uh, biodiversity and nature-based solutions such as uh, uh, reforestation, sustainable farming, and fishing. Now, the problems are the following. Number one, many of these nature-based solution uh, related projects, they lack uh, sufficient uh, cash flow or profitability. And secondly, they lack uh, good project owners that can qualify uh, for commercial financing. And thirdly, they lack the uh, professional operator or managers, uh, which will enhance their return on assets. And finally, uh, there's a lack of appropriate financial products, for example, long-term financing for some of these long-term solutions. So really, uh, the financial sector, including the regulators and financial institutions, will have to come up with solutions to address all of these uh, bottlenecks or barriers. For example, we need to develop compensation mechanisms for those projects uh, which are delivering environmental, climate, ecological benefits uh, to receive compensation from other projects. Um, just give you one example, if you can combine a real estate, very profitable project together with a, uh, mm, a forestry project, which is less profitable, then this combination of projects may be profitable enough for an investor. And secondly, we need to develop carbon credits, uh, for example, letting forestry uh, projects really to benefit uh, from selling the carbon credit and enhancing their return. And uh, uh, thirdly, we need to, uh, to really introduce channels through which long-term capital, including um, pension money and insurance money, can be engaged in these uh, nature-based solutions. And finally, equity investors will have to find ways to get into uh, these projects because many of these project owners lack capital, and uh, that's why they couldn't get uh, debt financing. So all these are potential areas we need to explore uh, to make sure that the finance will be made available to uh, nature-based solutions.
Right. Thank you very much, Mr. Marfo. Thank you for sharing with us your insights um, in why you think grief financing has been um, an area which has not had a lot of professional support, um, lack of uh, uh, profit flow, lack of professional managers, lack of long-term um, financing, and thank you for suggesting the different potential ways of making this area uh, more properly run, combination of projects, um, introducing different channels, etc. Um, we're going to move on to our next um, panelist, Mr. Anderson Tonotto of, G, uh, of RGE. Um, are you there, Mr. Tonotto? Yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hi, good evening. We all know Indonesia is really playing a leadership role um, in building out um, the potential for nature capital markets, uh, where the farmers can be paid for provisioning for ecosystem services, such as carbon um, sequestering. What more needs to be done to take this to scale, do you think? And how companies um, like the RGE can work towards the 2030 goal of net zero and nature positive economy? Uh, thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Um, hello, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to be here with such distinguished speakers. Uh, just to introduce myself, my name is uh, Anderson Tenoro. I'm the Managing Director of RGE. Uh, we're a cellulose, an agricultural company uh, integrated with renewable plantations based in uh, Indonesia, Brazil, and China. So there's no question that companies, regardless whether they are in emerging countries or developed countries, must focus on emissions reductions and work towards a net zero emissions. And our goal is to tie our business to positively impact nature. And that's the reality that we live in now. Uh, but the challenge, of course, is that we operate in a land-based industry, and we have learned it the hard way in the last 35 years. And the reality is protection and conservation forests in some emerging countries with huge populations, without active management, it does not stay forested. Uh, so we must put value in natural capital and recognize the co-benefits of nature um, that provides ecosystem services, biodiversity, and, of course, protecting some of these watersheds. The last five years of our journey since COP21 in Paris, we've committed something called the one for one. So every hectare of plantation, we commit one hectare of conservation and forest. And again, this is trying to tie our business together with nature as capital. Uh, in that process, we've conserved about 380,000 hectares of protection and conservation forest, about five times the size of Singapore. But it was a very challenging process for us. Uh, first, we, were not, we, were, we attempted to restore some of these forests but as a matter of fact, protecting some of these forests and letting nature heal itself is what we've learned in the last five years. It's been an incredible journey. It's actually much more cost effective and cost efficient to let nature heal itself. Uh, and we've seen that on the ground in Indonesia. Uh, second, how do we then make sure that these protection forests last for a long term? The shareholders, our companies, we've put $100 million for the first 10 years. We spent about $45 million the last five years protecting about 150,000 hectares of eco-restoration license beyond the conservation areas. It's not cheap. Conservation is not cheap. It's dirty, it's messy, it's challenging. Um, and that's the reality on the ground. And, and we must be able to roll up our sleeves and get the job done. But we've tried to actually tie our business again with conservation by putting a self-tariff model. So every ton of plantation wood they were producing out of a, net, of a landscape, we're actually putting a self-tariff of $1 back to conservation and restoration. So our goal is to really make sure that we can have a self-funded model as the world continues to discuss about natural capital financing, we're trying to find a feasible and pragmatic model on the ground. Uh, last but not least, actually, is to really work with partners. Uh, there's no question uh, both Greenpeace and WWF play a huge role seven years ago to nudge us to go towards this direction. It was a very important decision uh, from, from the business side to really push outside ourselves outside of our comfort zone. The reality is private sector needs to be pushed outside of their comfort zone. And we all know that growth and comfort, comfort does not coexist. And for us as private sector, we are being pushed outside of our comfort zone to go above and beyond just for profit, but also realizing uh, the value of, of nature. Uh, moving ahead, our goal is how can we scale this up to make 10 production protection compacts or 100 production protection compacts across Indonesia, Brazil, and globally? And what we need is the right partners 
in the conversation. We need governments with the right regulations to allow carbon credits to enhance some of these programs, but these carbon credits are not for profit. Now our goal is whatever carbon credits we generate from the restoration license, our goal is to plow it back to conservation and restoration again. So we have a self-moving mechanism that allows and encourages more conservation and restoration projects at large. But the reality is in emerging countries, we must have both the production and protection hand in hand. If we are only talking about protection, especially in emerging countries like Indonesia and Brazil, uh, it's very challenging. And our goal is to make sure when we produce anything from the landscape, we must actually draw from the production, have a self-imposed tariff or taxation and invest it back to nature and conservation. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Anderson, for sharing with us your insights from the industry. And we're now going to welcome our final speaker. We only have a few minutes left for this live streaming session, uh, Ms. Jennifer Morgan. Now you've heard from our panelists um, some very ambitious messages uh, presenting here today. Do these make you optimistic? Um, what do you think actions are needed to ensure that in this coming decade, um, all we do is sustainable and equitable for everybody from all countries. Well, thanks, Nancy, and thanks. It's great to be here with such um, amazing colleagues and listening and learning as we go. Um, you know, I've spent my whole life arguing that the climate crisis cannot be solved in isolation, that it requires economic changes and new mindsets and urgent emission reductions. So. Um, you know, and, and rights-based approaches. So, of course, I'm delighted. It, it makes me um, somewhat optimistic to see that we're finally getting to a world we, where we no longer pollute the atmosphere and allow, um, um, you know, our climate to heal, that we're finally on the way to combining those, that we need emission reductions, um, of course, and nature protection. I mean, and that's kind of a no-brainer. The question is how we, how we do that. But at the same time, I'm quite worried, I have to admit. Um, and that worry um, comes from two interconnected topics that are being discussed today. First, I'm worried that while I see the exponential growth of long-term commitments, I, I really don't see that much immediate action that is up to the job of really making us safe. And I, I wanna echo Inger Anderson here on the need for immediate action that's there. I, I fear that some of the announcements that are coming from governance, governments and they sound positive on net zero for 2050, that's 30 years from now. And oftentimes those commitments, they hide actually that there are no clear benchmarks or binding laws to achieve the targets. So too often it's more of an excuse to continue a destructive practice, unfortunately. And I think um, sometimes we see that the resistance to a systems change, which we've heard about here, is hiding behind that positive sounding banner of net zero. And that companies such as fossil fuel majors or airlines, they pretend that they are destructive business, that they continue their destructive business models because they're also investing in nature protection. And that's just, sorry to say, it's just not true. It's a lie. We have to do both. We have to reduce emissions from fossil fuels and agriculture and land use and forestry and increase the ability of the natural ecosystems to absorb excess carbon from the atmosphere. There's no either or. We're probably all agreed on that. But I think my second worry, I don't know how much agreement we have. And that's where, you know, since the Kyoto Protocol in 1997, the world has tried to make offsets work. And frankly, it hasn't. It just, there's so many problems with offsets. And so we no longer, we, we don't have time either to allow fossil fuel companies to continue to emit while um, and just try and plant trees or offset those emissions. There's just no time for anything like that anymore. And I think the initiatives on voluntary carbon markets, like the one that Mark Carney is going to uh, announce this evening, it, it has shortcomings in principle and practice that could really jeopardize genuine climate change mitigation and with it the Paris target. So instead, what do we need? We need the fundamental change to get a positive relationship with nature. We need to do nothing less than change the global rules of the economy. And voluntary commitments are just uh, a failure. Um, they have been a failure. And I mean, um, Anderson, you mentioned you've been nudged and pushed. I mean, you know that the commitments that were made for 2020, they have not been met by anyone on deforestation. And we have to move beyond those voluntary commitments. 
Uh, you know, many companies praised themselves on that. We even thought that would be okay for a while, but in the end, it didn't work. So if you're about nature positive approach, you need to take immediate action that supports communities to protect and restore nature without offsets. And you need to support not just the individual good projects, but systemic changes. We've heard some of those today, but they're really about rules governing the global economy, whether that be around government action to reduce meat consumption from high level, whether it be about different ways of doing forestry. We can uh, and must actually look at our fundamental changes in trade and finance, relocalization of supply chains. So in the end, am I optimistic? I am optimistic um, because over the last year, more and more people woke up to the need for fundamental change. You're seeing that in surveys around the world, change is coming, and we need to make 2021 be the year of systems change. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Jennifer Morgan. I'm going to quickly wrap up. Um, thank you very much for our five panelists for sharing with us your insights. Um, as uh, Minister Aslam rightly put it, nature really strikes back when we don't treat nature properly. So we really need to start to value nature um, and that's when we start to protect nature. Uh, we need to have the COP conventions be translated into action plans. We also call for solidarity um, across borders. Uh, we need to find different ways more methods to channel green finance. And as we see, the COVID-19 crisis has really transcended borders in many ways than one. And we saw unprecedented levels of international cooperation uh, with information sharing and healthcare equipment sharing. And I think this pandemic's really taught us when we work together among different nations, we can act um, and we can um, channel great change. Thank you again. Our five panelists for sharing with us your wonderful insights and remarks. And this now um, has come to the end of our live streaming session.